Dear Denver Community Church, this morning, rather than preach a typical sermon, I'm going to read you a letter. This letter is for those of you who've long called DCC home. It's for those of you who've not been here long but sensed from the moment you found us this was always home, and for those of you who are wondering if DCC could be your home. It's for those of you scattered all over this planet of ours who faithfully listen to our podcast, and for those who log on to YouTube to watch our services each week. And if you're attending for the first time this morning or you're visiting, this letter is for you too, as it will tell you a bit about who we are here as a people, a congregation, a community, a family, a church called DCC. This letter is one that in many ways I've been writing to all of you since I accepted the role of lead pastor at Denver Community Church nearly 17 years ago when I rolled into Denver driving a large rented yellow moving truck with my 2001 Volkswagen Jetta in tow. Back then, DCC had gone through a tremendously difficult season and weathered a terrific storm, and there was a small group of people here who kept the doors of DCC open. They believed in the face of struggle and insurmountable odds, God was not done with them, that God was not done with this place, and they weren't done with it either. Their commitments and their work and their trust in God and in one another, and above all, God's grace carried them through. It was their sense of commitment that first drew me to this place, and when I arrived, I was filled with nerves and dreams, tension and hope anticipations and questions. On the very first day I arrived at our building on Washington Street on an early Sunday morning, I walked right into the auditorium, I sat down on the platform, and I took out my journal and I began to write. In that journal entry from July, 2000, or July 8, 2007, I prayed for the people of DCC to be those who would bring peace and put flesh and bone on the love of Jesus. None of, this, none of us knew whether this thing was going to work out. We all took a risk. And while we imagined together what could be, we had no idea what would be. The only thing we had to offer was our full selves, including our wounds and our doubts and our fears. Rather than hide those things, we believed that exposing them made us candidates for grace. And we thought if that happened, we would not just receive it, but grace would flow through us and toward others as well. And pretty soon we saw something taking shape that was beyond any of us, beyond our vision, beyond our efforts, beyond our imagination. Together we held questions as sacred, trusting there's always more to learn in constantly new places and new ways to grow. As people joined with us, they recognized this was a place they could belong because they too had wounds and doubts and fears. One Sunday, not long after I started here, there was a guy who stood in the back of the room during Eucharist watching as people came forward to receive the bread and the wine. He never moved. He just took it all in. After our gathering, he came up to me and said, I stood outside the doors of this building, not sure if I was going to come in this morning, and I told God, this is your last chance with me. Then I watched everyone take communion and something in me said, This place is a safe harbor for you. This is the kind of place I want to be a part of. A few weeks after that, a couple, young couple showed up, and when our gathering concluded, the husband walked toward me while his wife remained seated. And I noticed she had tears streaming down her face, and her bottom lip was quivering, and she had a tender, pained look about her. He introduced himself, and he didn't waste any time. He simply said, I'm an alcoholic, and I need help. It turns out he had just confessed the same thing to his wife hours earlier, and because of this community, he now had a place to go for help. Person after person, life after life, story after story, finding hope, finding healing, finding each other, and most of all, finding Jesus. It's stories like these and so many more that make it difficult to describe this faith community. Because sometimes it's hard to know what to say because there's little or nothing to say. But other times, it's hard to know what to say because there is so much you could say. 
And anytime I'm asked what this church is like, I often find it hard to say anything because there are so many powerful and beautiful and brilliant ways to describe this community. So what can I say? I I could talk about your generosity, something I experienced very early on. Several months after beginning my work here on the first cold autumn day, I arrived at our building and it was a chilly 50 degrees in my office. And we quickly figured out the furnaces were broken and well beyond repair. Though I had recently moved from the Arctic tundra of western Michigan, sitting in that cold office for hours chilled me to my core. More importantly, we had children coming each Sunday, and no matter how resilient kids can be, we thought better of having them attend DCC Kids in frigid classrooms. Thankfully, the weather warmed up over the weekend, but we knew more cold weather was on its way. We had nowhere near what it would cost to install new furnaces, so we asked you. But we couldn't just ask, so we invited you to bring your pennies and your nickels and your dimes and your quarters. That's right, a good old-fashioned change drive. The following Sunday, we found a galvanized steel trash can, and we put it on the platform, and one by one, you walked down the aisle with Tupperware bowls and jars and piggy banks and bags filled with coins, and you dumped them into that steel trash can. It was brilliant, and it was loud, and it was a bad idea. (laughs) Because you gave so much that morning, we could not move the trash can (laughs) due to the sheer weight of the currency you deposited into it. But we did get more than enough for new furnaces. That was my first experience of your generosity, and it's only continued. Over the years, you've given toward disaster relief, clean water initiatives, malaria nets, helping vulnerable people get to safety. You've given so we can help our unhoused friends find sustainable places to live. You've given to offer assistance to those seeking asylum. In my time here, DCC has given away millions of dollars to ministry partners in the city of Denver and around the world. Your generosity has quite literally changed and renewed the lives of tens of thousands of people. And you've not only given your resources, you've given your time, your passion, your gifts, your talents, and most of all, you've given your hearts. And how do you put a price on that? I could talk about how you selflessly serve people both here and in many other places. Each Sunday, many of you, Show up early to make coffee, which is something this preacher is grateful for because it has been, at times, key to helping people stay awake during my sermons. (laughs) You show up to clean the parking lot, to get the building ready, to welcome those who walk through our doors, and doing this with a smile and, when needed, a hug. You've played and sang and ran slides and mixed sound for countless Sunday gatherings. You spent hours and hours nurturing our children, nurturing my children in DCC Kids and Inc. You've invested in and worked alongside our ministry partners, lending dignity to people often overlooked, ignored, and relegated to the margins. One of my favorite things about working here is when I speak with our ministry partners around town who tell me how much they love the people of DCC. And they say this because of your tireless commitment to serve and love and care for others. I could talk about the depth of soul you possess and your deep love for each other. I've witnessed selfless care and compassion extended to those who are hurting. I've seen you cry tears for those who have no more tears to cry. I've watched as you've given up your own comfort to comfort one another. I've seen your courage and your humility, which is the midwife of honesty and authenticity. You've challenged me to grow and to heal and to trust just by living your authentic lives in front of me. Your depth has led me deeper. I could talk about the laughter in this place, whether it is the courtesy laugh I get for most of my jokes, like that one, (laughs) or the occasional actual laughter I get for very few of my jokes. I can't count how many times I've laughed with you over the years, not laughing at each other, but laughing with each other, and there's a world of difference between the two. It's the laughter I hear when you are together after our Sunday gatherings. It's the laughter among our staff, and I'm talking about the good kind of laughter, the kind that comes from deep places that points to joy. And this is no small thing, 
because laughter requires its own kind of vulnerability and joy, a certain kind of courage. I could talk about the mercy, forgiveness, kindness, and grace extended within this community, knowing we are not perfect, but rather than use that as an excuse for poor actions and behavior. When we become aware of our imperfections, we work together toward repair and continued growth and deeper healing and greater wholeness. I could talk how we've worked not to align ourselves with easy arguments or simple stances or lazy viewpoints that only lead to further polarization. Rather, we've sought to be transcendent in all that we do and say, not wanting to seek middle ground, but to seek higher ground so that everyone will know they belong, not to us, but to God. So anytime I'm asked what this church is like, I often find it hard to say anything because I could go on and on and on, but here's what I know. Those things I witnessed among you in those initial days and all the days since are still true today. They're even more true today. And while so many beautiful things have stayed the same, we've also experienced all sorts of changes over the years too. When we were in our building on Washington Street with its low ceilings and stunning faux stained glass, we grew from one service to two and then to three, and how about adding a fourth service in the evening? Then we bought this building, and we moved toward existing as one church in two locations. It was on this platform that our elder team announced our move toward full inclusion for our LGBTQ plus siblings. We sought forgiveness from those we had excluded only to be met with the beauty of mercy and gracious love and a big heartedness that has led us to be an even greater expression of the kingdom of God here on this earth. Then there was the pandemic, the day everything in our world changed. And we shifted to online gatherings which felt more like creating a weekly television broadcast than planning an in-person gathering. And in that seismic change, you still logged on and engaged from wherever you were stuck quarantining to worship and to connect. And you did this for a year. When we came back together, we went back to gathering at one location, believing it was a healthier expression of who we are, all of us in one place. Then we sold the Wash Park building. Then we bought another building. And now we're selling that building. We've seen the number of people attend grow. We've seen the number of people on staff grow. We've seen each other grow. We've seen our kids grow and we've seen gray hair grow. So many changes. And this morning, there's another change coming. One that is a new beginning for all of us. Now that word change, it has the power to excite us or sadden us or frighten us. Because while change always presents an opportunity, it is also a form of loss. While change opens some doors, it also closes others. And whatever we feel in the midst of change, it's okay. There is no right way to feel. The best we can do is simply pay attention to whatever we feel and surrender to that. The seed of change that's coming was planted long before I ever loaded up that yellow moving truck. It was planted when I accepted my first job as a teaching pastor at a church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. From the very start, my wife and I committed never to use the church or my work as a pastor to build my career or establish my brand. It may be surprising for you to know, but like any profession, pastors are always tempted to climb the ladder of achievement and success to move toward the bigger and the better and the brighter. But we decided we'd never do that. We wanted to give everything, all of us, wherever we were, for as long as we were called to be in that place. The other side of this is, we would be open any time there was an invitation to something else or to somewhere else, but we agreed it would always have to be an invitation and that we were not going to invite ourselves. Over the last two plus decades in this work, we've received many invitations and pol politely declined nearly all of them, with the exception of a few, DCC being one of them. But now another invitation has been extended to me. And like the others, it was something that came to me. It was not something I pursued, and it was not some, one that I expected. In November 2020, amid the pandemic, a friend and colleague reached out to me. This fellow lives across the pond in the UK, and we've known each other for many years. And we first met in 2014 when he led me through a leadership intensive. 
an intensive that saved me from burnout and changed the way I lived my life. As a result, I became healthier and more whole. This is why when he called during the pandemic to ask if I'd like to learn to lead others through the leadership intensive that changed the way I live my life, I immediately said yes. Because I could help others learn what I learned. I could help others change the way they live in the same way I changed the way I live. I could help others become healthier and more whole just as I became healthier and more whole. Several months after this invitation, our oldest child graduated from high school and on the same day, our youngest finished elementary school. This elementary school is where all of our children had attended and something our family had been a part of for 13 years. And on that day, the thought of a new season in life visited my wife and me. And something began stirring. It was this stirring that led me to share with our elder team in my annual review in June of 2021 that this was the first time I've ever served at DCC that I've ever considered what may be in store for me after DCC. At that time, I didn't make too much of it. I was not concerned initially about the stirring, but I was curious, and I chose to give it the attention it deserved. The more I paid attention to it, I began to wonder how my vocation, which is not my job, but the calling that God has hardwired into me. I began to wonder how my vocation might be used in other ways to serve the world. I found myself asking, is there another vehicle that could bring my vocation into the world in a new way? I was not in a hurry to respond to this question as I've always loved being a part of DCC. For years, I've spent the best hours of my day doing what I love alongside people I love. And I knew what responding to this question might mean. I carried this question with me when I went on sabbatical in the spring of 2022. And during that time, my wife and I spent hours talking and dreaming and wondering and discussing and discerning. And the more we did, the more we began to feel like we could maybe respond with an answer. But it was an answer I was resistant to. On my first Sunday back from sabbatical on September 18, 2022, I preached a sermon about obedience and all that word means. I shared that the root of the word obedience comes from the Latin word meaning to listen. I spoke of how we need to be, how we need to be those who are willing to listen, to respond, and to act. I reflected if we choose to listen, a new space opens up within us that before was only potential. And it is that space it is that change within us that changes what God can do in the world. To listen, then, is an act of co-creation, which is a sacred task all of us are invited into. I concluded the sermon asking this question. I'm sorry, I concluded the sermon saying, obedience asks us a question, what will we create? When I got into my car to head home after preaching that sermon, I knew I had preached it to myself. Obedience was asking me, what will we create? I imagined what creating something new could look like, and I knew for the first time, whatever that was, it was not going to be in my current role as the lead pastor of Denver Community Church. In the first elder meeting of 2023, I told the team my clock for my departure had begun ticking. I had no timeline. I had no plan, but I had chosen to listen. There were tears, there was grief, but there was also support and understanding and a recognition that something new was on the horizon. As 2023 moved from the short, cold days of winter into the longer, warmer days of spring, my wife and I spent a weekend together dreaming about what we might co-create in this world of ours. At the end of the weekend, we realized our dreaming was about what we might do, what I might do, apart from my role here at DCC. We took the month of May 2023 to speak with our closest friends, to pray and to listen more than ever. When we came to the end of May, we had clarity and we knew the timeline. At the beginning of June 2023, I told my support team, made up of a few elders, I would give two more years to Denver Community Church, and then on June 1, 2025, will be the day that I would step away from my role as lead pastor and I and all of us will embark on a new beginning. Nearly 18 years after I first arrived in Denver. 
I'm aware there's all sorts of feelings and emotions and thoughts rising up within you as you listen. And all those things likely have questions attached to them. While we will respond to the many questions in time, allow me to respond to the most common ones I've been asked. One being, did the difficult year of 2023 speed up your timeline? And the answer is no. It actually slowed down my timeline because I knew leaving during that time would only have had harm and confusion in the midst of a complicated and difficult year. The other common question that has come up is, what are you going to do? Well, in the season to come, I will be going to work with leaders and companies and teams and nonprofits and churches as a guide and a coach and a consultant. I will also continue to lead retreats and I'll lead pilgrimages and I'll speak as opportunities arise. In many ways, I will be doing what I've long done as a pastor in a local church, but now my practice of ministry will simply happen in a new context with many people who would never attend a church service. In the coming months, I, along with the leadership of DCC, will discern how I will continue to serve and be a part of Denver Community Church in a new way because my family and I plan to stay in Denver because seriously, where else would we live? And there's no other church that we want to be a part of. Perhaps the most important word in that second question, what am I going to do, is the word going. I'm going. I'm moving toward the invitation I've received, which means I'm going towards something new. And I know that in going, there's also leaving. That any time you move towards something, you are at the same time moving away from something. So as I go toward what's next, it's also leaving years after feeling that initial stirring. And being invited to move towards something new, I'm also moving away from where I have been. And this, this is where the sadness is. In all the discussions and thoughts and prayers over these last three years, anytime tears welled up, anytime grief walked in my door, anytime sadness sat down alongside me, I found myself gratefully saying, welcome. Because what a thing it is to sit here with you this morning and read this letter accompanied by tears. What a thing it is to have come this far together through the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, the hurt and the healing, the failures and the successes, the I'm sorry's and I forgive you's, the sorrow and the joy and still be able to look one another in the eye and say, I love you. This place has been for all of us a work of love and heart and joy and at times pure grit. Looking back at that journal from July, 2000, or July 8, 2007, I do so with boundless gratitude that God heard my prayer and has given me the joy of seeing the people of DCC come, become those who bring peace and put flesh and bone on the love of Jesus. And I know God's not done answering that prayer in and through all of us. I cannot tell you all that it means to be a part of this faith community, and I'm confident I never will, no matter how much time I, try, I spend trying to express it. From the very start, you've trusted me with so much, and I'll never find the words to express what that meant then and what that means now. But right here, right now in this moment, I simply want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. I love this place. I love what God's done in us. I love what God's done through us. And I love what God has yet to do with us. My friends, this is the beginning of a new beginning. And so as we begin again, to each and every one of you I say, so much love and peace and grace, your brother, Michael.